You know, today we live in a world that values and praises power and strength. It seems like every time you, you read an article sometimes talking about someone, they're talking about they're a powerful force in Washington or they're this and they have this control over this. You know, such a person might be described when they're writing about them in a newspaper or article or magazine or whatever as not only strong or maybe powerful, but they might use a word like aggressive, uh, dynamic, um, things like that to, to describe them. But, you know, this, these areas or these types of characteristics are somewhat at odds with the biblical description of a Christian. In the area of, of Matthew chapter 5 and what is called the Beatitudes, <clears throat> let's look and see what it says there. It says in, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. And blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and you shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So, you know, these characteristics is talking about of a Christian, poor in spirit, mourning, meek, merciful. Those don't coincide with strong and powerful in that sense of the word. None of these attributes really describe the type of character that what would be normally called by the world today a strong or a powerful personality. So then what, did it, what would you think about maybe these scriptures that following? You don't necessarily need to turn there, but you might want to write them down to look over them later because some of them I'll be taking totally out of context and I don't want to you know, turn you around. But in Romans chapter 15, verse 1, it says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, it says, Watch you, stand fast in the faith. And the word in the King James is quit, but really it would be better uh, uh, translated as act. Act you like men. Be strong. 1 John chapter 2, and verse 14 says, I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong. Now, each of these scriptures, as I quoted them, is taken somewhat out of context, and I did it deliberately to prove a point. All of them, in their proper context, are actually speaking of being strong through Christ. So they're not talking about us necessarily being strong per se. You know, you know one of the most recognizable songs ever, and both of you, I can give you the first couple of words of it, and you'll know what I'm speaking about, is one we all learned as children. It says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. One of the first songs probably, do, they, do we still teach it to our children? Does that song, I don't hardly hear it anymore. We used to even sing it in services from time to time. The first line from uh, an old hymn just a closer walk with thee, says, I am weak, but you are strong. You know, these words we seem to sort of get into a conflict here to some extent. The Apostle Paul probably has the most recognizable scripture dealing with this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I mean chapter 12, <clears throat> excuse me, beginning in verse 9. And he said unto me, and sometimes, like I said, you might want to just listen because I'm going through some of these scriptures pretty fast. I've got them in my notes, so I don't have to turn to them. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength, Christ speaking, is made perfect in weakness. So through the, the Apostle Paul. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Then he goes on to say in verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. Now, you know, people said he took pleasure in infirmities. Now, none of us <clears throat> take pleasure in infirmities. We don't like to be sick. We don't like to have problems or anything else. But, of course, Paul, is, if you understand the context, he's, he's talking about it in a com completely different context. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. When I am weak, then in effect Christ is strong in me. 
all this again flies in the face of logic. It flies in the face of reason and of this world's values. And unfortunately, I'm afraid it flies sometimes in the face of some of us as professing Christians and our understanding and our actions. And I think this is part of the reason why C.S. Lewis, in his book that's entitled Mere Christianity, he describes sufferings, and listen to this, he describes sufferings as a severe mercy. The difficulties that we face, the persecutions, the trials, the things that we go under, are severe mercy mercy. I don't think anyone would normally describe them as mercy, but we'll go on to understand this maybe a little bit better. Too often, most of us, and especially this world, many of us in most of this world, assume that dependence upon anything or dependence upon anyone is a sign of weakness. Do it myself. Stand on my own two feet. I can do it myself. If If you're very much of a reader, of much of Western materials, and I'm, I'm a big reader of Lou Lemoore's. I always describe their characters. You know, they're two-fisted and strong and, you know, valiant and all this kind of stuff. They stand on their own two feet all the time. But if we do anything that is dependent upon someone else, sometimes we feel somehow insufficient, maybe inadequate, or maybe somewhat flawed. In our own vain, yet futile attempts to eliminate any dependency upon anybody else, we actually make it more difficult for God to use us. We definitely almost thwart God. As it turns out, human dependency, depending upon someone else and especially depending upon God, is not some kind of a flaw in our character. In fact, on the contrary, it is intentionally designed by God. And when we, in trying to eliminate dependency, we only succeed in eliminating the essence of who we really are. The essence of who God formed us to be. Who we were designed by Him to be. And we succeed in eliminating that essence as we try to do this. The trials, the tests, the sufferings, the difficulties that we go through Again, according to C.S. Lewis in his book, they call us from the folly of self-sufficiency by confronting us with our true state. When we go through a trial, we go through a test, we have some kind of suffering or difficulty in our life, they call us from the folly of self-sufficiency by confronting us with our true state. Each and every one of us are designed and called to be a vessel for God. God didn't call you to save you. God called us to use us, and in one sense of the word, to use us up. But if we are so full of ourselves, how can God fill us with His Holy Spirit? I think most of us, at one time or another in our life, we talk about being dependent upon God. <clears throat> we even talk about it as if it were a choice that we have to make. But at the most basic level of all reality, it is not really a choice. It is the given order of the reality of life. God is the creator. We did not evolve. And if God is the creator, then everything else is created. So we are totally dependent upon Him. Now, you know, we know what's taught in schools today. We know what the scientists all say. You know, we evolved from where the pond scum or a big bang somewhere. Uh, If that's what you want to believe, that's fine. Um, I don't like that idea that I came from pond scum. Now, maybe maybe you're all right with that, but uh, I don't don't go that way. Um, God is also the sustainer of all of life. So all else is, and according to the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, all things are upheld by the word of His power. Didn't say some things, says all things are upheld by the word of His power. And I think we probably know that, but incidentally this particular verse is speaking of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 28, it says, for in Him we live 
we move and we have our being. In effect, in, in all that we do, that's where God is. In everything that we do, that's where He should be. We do have a choice. There's no question we have a choice. But the choice is not to be dependent or, or not to be or not to be dependent upon God, but it's whether or not we admit our dependence upon Him. We do not have a choice about whether it's true or not. We only have a choice to whether or not we admit it. Every one of us are created with a space inside of us that needs to be filled. Have you ever talked to someone who talks about their, you know, they, they're not sure what they should do in life. They're wandering around, not sure what they should do with their life. They're, they feel have an empty feeling. They're not sure what's missing in their life, but something's missing. For the most part, that's because they do not have a relationship with God. Because there is a space inside of each of us that is waiting to be filled with God. And the scriptures actually say that both the Father and the Son will dwell there if we invite them in. One of those scriptures is found over in John chapter 14 in verse 23 where it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So is the question pertinent in the sense that we ask, do God and Jesus Christ live within me? In Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15, For thus says the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. He says, I dwell in the high and holy place. Who do I dwell with? With him that also is of a contrite and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Just another scripture showing that God wants to dwell with us. It's our choice whether we're going to or not, whether we're going to invite him into our life or are we going to, in effect, run from him? I gave a series of uh, Bible studies and sermons years ago, and it was called Running from God, because I was doing that at that particular time. And I was trying to fight my way through the, the situation I found myself in. And it, it's something that we, if we're not careful, it's, it's so easy to get into that kind of a, of a feeling, because we're not sure where we ought to be going, what we need to be doing. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. For in verse 29, he gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Now, you know, I know from a, of a realistic standpoint, especially those of us of the male gender, we don't want to say that we're weak. We don't want to say that there's nothing that we can't do. You know, we can do it all. Just get out of the way and let me do it, and, you know, maybe I'll make it done, maybe I won't, but I'm sure not going to ask how to do it. No. Nobody here has ever done that, except me, maybe. In verse 30, it says, Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. In verse 31, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. All these attributes of strength come as we submit ourselves unto God and let Him live in our life. There is a song called On Eagle's Wings. And in the very first verse of the song, it says, You who dwell in the shelter of the Lord... Those who abide in his shadows for life say to the Lord, my refuge, my rock, in whom I trust. And then in the refrain, it says, and he will raise you up on eagle, eagle's wings. Reminds me of the scripture in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 14. If you don't remember what that is, you can go back later and look it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. Know you not that you are the temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If that Spirit dwells within us, 
if we're not so full of ourselves that we're trying to do everything on our own, then when we have that spirit, there is nothing that's impossible for us to do. There's nothing we can't overcome. There's nothing we can't fulfill. We have trouble from time to time. But again, remember what C.S. Lewis said. Each of these tests, these troubles that come along sometimes, is God's way of leading us to better understand where we need to be. Do we fully understand and comprehend that we were created for something much larger than this human life? It's so easy to get wrapped up in day-to-day -day living. Sometimes, especially for those of you poor people that are still having to work for a living and are not retired like some of us. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but it, it comes to all of us. Um, we do. We get, we get wrapped up in life. Going to work every day, 8 to 5, whatever it is. And all the other things that come along in life, especially if we have children, the demands they make on us. It's so easy to get so wrapped up in what we're doing in life that we forget about what is really going on here. That all the things that we enjoy in this life, the art, the music that we see around us, the relationships that we have with our friends and our family, that all of this is just a foreshadowing. It's a looking forward to something that is much, much bigger. Something bigger than this world that we live in. We currently are simply sojourners passing through this temporary life. Just as the Feast of Tabernacles also reflects as a part of its meanings the intransigency of life, this is our temporary home. For as it says over in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 13, speaking of all those who had gone before, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, embraced them, and then confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. And that's really all we are. We're passing through this earth. We're looking for our final home. And it's a far off, but we have seen it and we are striving for it. We're persuaded of it. We embrace it. Hopefully we're all striving to go stronger. But we actually become weaker if we try to, by the old method of measuring, pull our ourselves up by our own bootstraps, if we try to handle all of our own problems, if we seek to be self-sufficient, we in effect deny God. We all desperately need God. And He delights, He wants, He desires our need for Him. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 2. It says, The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. And then in Psalms 18 and verse 2, it says, The Lord is my rock. He is my fortress, my deliverer, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler, the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. It is God that girds me with strength. You know, all these scriptures go together to paint a picture that we are stronger, as the scriptures have said, when we are our weakest, when we are depending the most on God. But in order to truly embrace God as our strength, as the one who provides all that we have needs of, to, to fully recognize our own weaknesses, we must first truly and fully admit that we are totally dependent upon God. There's another old hymn, Wherever He Leads I'll Go. It closes the first verse with, Surrender your all today. And it's interesting to me that it says surrender your all. It doesn't just say surrender, but surrender your all. The question is not do we trust God, not have we just surrendered to God, but have we surrendered all? Is, are we holding something back? Or are we fully and totally committed? In doing so, we drop our own striving for independence and our striving for self-sufficiency. If we don't, 
just when we think we're getting along pretty good on our own, that things are going really well, that we are enjoying our own abilities, our own strength, something is liable to come along to expose just how dependent we are. It could come through something small in our life or something large. In Psalms chapter 34, beginning of verse 17, it says, The righteous cry, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near unto them, in verse 18, that are of a broken heart, and save such as be of a contrite spirit. Many, in verse 19, are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. For those who are totally dependent upon him, who have surrendered their all to him. Psalms 119 and verse 141. I am small and despised, yet do not I forget your precepts. Your righteousness is of an everlasting righteousness, and your law is the truth. Trouble and anguish have taken hold on me, yet your commandments are my delights. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live. Now, I don't want anyone to misinterpret or misunderstand what I'm saying. This is not to say in any shape, fashion, or form that God causes evil or He causes bad things to happen in our lives. But sometimes He does use these things to help us see our own shortcomings and our own weaknesses. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 said, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men would count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, that is one of the most promising scriptures in all of the, of the Bible. I mean, there's lots of other good ones and great ones. But when it says that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. As a part of that, he will do whatever is necessary Whatever it takes in our own particular lives, you know, we're all different, to help us see our own shortcomings and to overcome them. In James chapter 1 and verse 13, however, it does say, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. So I'm not saying in any shape, again, fashion of the word, that God causes these things. The old comedian um, Flip Wilson used to always say, always say, the devil made me do it. Some of you that are older may remember him and remember how he used to do it, the show he used to have on television. Uh, he, I'm not going to try to imitate his voice because I do a bad, bad uh, imitation of it. But you know, we don't really need the devil to cause all these problems. We're good enough at doing it ourselves. He can sometimes just sit back and let us stew in our own mud, as it turns out. But you know, at the same time, we know that God will always give us the strength we need to fight any battle that comes along in life, no matter what it is. Something that has bothered a lot of people for many, many years, and probably still does, and I think all of us from time to time have questions, is why is it that God does not heal when we pray to him we know he can heal we've seen evidence of his healing and I can't answer that question except to say God's will be done he knows down the line what's best in every circumstance in every situation wherever we come to it when my mother was extremely ill and critical with bone cancer I prayed that God would save her. He didn't. But I also prayed at the same time that if he was not, it was not his will at this time to save her, to take her quickly because she was in a great deal of pain. And he did. I think my family may have thought I was calloused at her funeral, but God had answered my prayer. Did he answer my preferential prayer, you might say? No, but he answered my prayer. And there are many other situations like that that all of us can look back on probably in our life and see. 
we put God too many times in a box and have the answer already decided what we want for that answer. But God just simply does not always answer us that way. Do we always pray, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 says, Wherefore let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There has no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. I probably throw many times in my life, you know, I'm the only person that's ever gone through this. Nobody else is ever experiencing, you know, the problems I'm having. Wrong. <laughs> There's probably been a lot of people done it a whole lot worse than that. <clears throat> and a lot more to come that would probably be just as bad, if not worse. But it goes on to say, God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that that you are able. But he will, with that temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. It's a promise. A promise we can call on that we know he will hear and he will answer. But you know, for most of us, learning to be dependent as opposed to independent, learning how to have strength through weakness, it's not easy. We live in a society that, as we mentioned earlier, values strength, self-sufficiency. And in some instances, that's good. It's certainly good, a good trait to have in our everyday life. For example, God tells us in the Scriptures, if we don't work, we don't eat. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10 says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if you don't work, you don't eat. So there are certain things that we need to do for ourselves and need to do. But we, we can ask God for help as well in that. But in all of our dealings with God, we must learn, as it says over in 2 Samuel verse 22, I mean chapter 22 and verse 33, that God is my strength and my power, and He makes my way perfect. If I go to messing it up or messing around with it, that's when things get off. But God will make it perfect. Contrary to belief in the teachings of men, putting our trust, putting our hope and our faith and surrendering our all to God's hand does not in any way diminish us. In fact, it is our destiny. It's why we were created. It's why each of you have been called. It is what we were given and what we were created by God and for God. To be dependent upon Him. To allow Him to make it well. There's a scripture found over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning verse 25. It says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many noble, not many mighty are called. And you know, you look around any congregation of the churches of God. You don't see too many billionaires. Anybody out there? Raising their hand? No? Okay. You don't see too many kings or princes or politicians, and I'm glad of that. But no, maybe I shouldn't be. But <laughs> You don't see those that in this world think that they're mighty and noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. The base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. That no flesh should glory in His presence. But of Him are you, each one of us, in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That according as it is written, He that glories let him glory in the Lord. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of 
of the Spirit and of the power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's where we get our power, our strength from God. In chapter 2 and verse 2 of that first, same 1 first Corinthians, it says again, I want to read that. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Is that how we carry ourselves? Is that how we conduct our lives? It is not our strength. It is not our power. It is not any knowledge save Christ and Him crucified. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 it says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And just as the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians encouraged the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, he said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Our strength comes through being strong in the power of the Lord and in the strength and the power of His might, not of our own. Paul also said over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10, For when I am weak, then am I strong. When I am surrendering to God completely and totally, then I am strong. Then we too can have strength through weakness, as Paul mentioned. But it is only through our complete and total acceptance of Jesus Christ and Him crucified for each of us. Now that is real power. That is real strength. So if we want to be really strong, if we want to be really powerful, strong in Christ, strong and through Christ, we must first learn how to be weak in self. For truth, strength, and power comes only when we surrender our all. Now go surrender. <laughs>